uh, Robert Gates, the former Defense Secretary of the United States, in his uh, farewell speech in the Pentagon, uh, he took the Europeans to tax in terms of their spending per GDP on defense, that we cannot continue to be subsidizing Europe, they must stand up. Now, all the comments they have been making is about the success of the common security policy in terms of France and the UK in the economic and political area. What of the military aspects? Right. What is there any safeguard in the common and security policy that we protect NATO infrastructure in terms of duplication, in terms of sovereignty, in terms of national interest? What are the safeguards in place to make sure this common security co policy since 1993 can take full effect? No worries. You'll be in relationship with um, the The roles of, 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 the, the, of, of the EU in defence and NATO are complementary and should be complementary, and the shift in the French position in recent years has made that much easier. You know we have real problems over the Cyprus issue in terms of how easy it is to cooperate between these two institutions which have their headquarters about three kilometers apart. And that remains a real obstacle. Um, but um, if you actually look at what's been happening in the Horn of Africa, um, actually we started off with a NATO uh, task force and an EU task force. I am told that NATO people regard the EU as having had a much more effective role in the overall anti-power scenes, re-stabilizing Somalia, partly because it's much easier to have a comprehensive military and civil approach. Clearly, when it comes to key security issues in Europe, the Article 5 issues, NATO remains extremely important, and uh, I think that we have to go down the road to discussing pooling and sharing further among the because we have to maintain um, our ability to contribute to NATO. But NATO in Afghanistan has been about contributing outside the region. Um, the operations in Libya, and to a lesser extent, the operations in and around Mali, uh, have shown that there are areas where the Americans are willing to support European action, but not to lead. And that is perhaps part of the model of the way forward. Emeril, it's your views on how the relationship should work. Well, I thought that was an incredibly comprehensive answer <laughs> and one that um, made some points that I would have made. I think that, I think that there has been a shift in terms of the US's role in the world, and that has an impact on uh, how Europe uh, acts uh, in the world and, and has an impact on the NATO-EU uh, relationship. Um, they are, the Americans are more reluctant um, to get involved. We saw them, as you said, um, Lord Wallace in, in Libya take more of a backseat approach than we've seen in the past. If that had been, if, the, if what happened in Libya had been five years ago, seven years ago, I think the Americans would have taken more of a leap. So um, it's certainly the case that they are asking, as, as a friend from King's College uh, implied in his question, they are asking European nations to do more. Uh, and in order to do more, as Lord Wallace has said, um, there perhaps will need to be some pooling in certain areas in defence, because in all member states there is severe pressure on defence measures. Will Europe respond in the way that the United States wants it to? I, I, I wonder. I mean, Gates made these points in, in Brussels um, as well. Um, and ever since he was banging the drum about Europe needs to spend more money on defence, practically every country, including this country, has responded by cutting their spending. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but of course, the Americans are not cutting their spending on defence. Well, that could be the response, as well. not, that they just, uh, they just don't. It may be, but I, I do actually think, I mean, it's a very interesting question. I do think there, there are going to be questions about the future of NATO um, that are worth pondering um, post Afghanistan. I mean, my reading of America, which I, don't, I follow Europe much more closely than America, my reading of America is they would like to think that a region of the world, Europe, the Balkans, perhaps North Africa, um, uh, perhaps the Eastern Partnership countries, the Caucasus, are areas that they can largely leave to Europe. Um, that they think that there are other places they should, the Americans should be dealing with, um, China, India, and so on. 
And I think that does increase a bit by, even in this area, the one reservation, naturally, is why was NATO first set up, and the reason why NATO exists is because of the Russian threat. And there are members of the European Union who still think there is a Russian threat, and I have some sympathy with their view that there could be a Russian threat. So clearly NATO will continue to have a key role in, in that. But I think the Balkans have shown that NATO's involvement has just steadily gone down in the Balkans, and I think that's correct. The Balkan problem, insofar as it is a problem, is a European problem. It's not a NATO-type problem, and it shouldn't be. Uh, I'm David Abenis, uh, Vice President of the Global Diplomatic Forum. Um, I'd like to go down uh, the, the, the road of the technical question, and uh, particularly to, uh, uh, in response to what John Peel said about the potential for shared embassies and even um, the single embassy. And I'd like to raise a concern that this may be slightly too much of a Eurocentric um, approach to the question. Diplomacy is a two-way uh, stream. So we're talking here about certain former colonial countries leading the way in certain areas um, to represent the whole of Europe. Isn't there a danger that this could be perceived by the other as um, you know, probably a return to the um, uh, uh, division of the world between certain European powers. And the, the, the other question is, of course, because of the principle of reciprocity, um, those individual countries will have a say on whether or not they can accept a shared embassy or a single embassy uh, from coming, you know, representing the EU. And my final point is, where would all that leave? the cultural influence and the cultural <coughs> exchange between two countries, which is an essential part of the girls. Uh, I mean, to be honest, I think you would have been better at trying to answer some of that question than, than me. Do you want but to since I, Well, no, since I raised it, I, just, <laughs> <laughs> I think some of what I was saying was, was, not, was more technical than political. I mean, cultural interests clearly are often looked after by other institutions, like, for example, the British Council. Um, which would operate in a different way, or, or the uh, Goethe Institute, or, or, or their equivalents in, in the, the Institute of Cervantes for Spain. Um, and I think that sort of thing would continue. I'm sure bilateral relations would also continue, but I think there are potentially, I'd be interested to know whether William Wallace agrees with this, arrangements whereby you could share buildings, you could have you know, single people who are identified as you know, the ambassador, but all within a group. And sometimes there could be cases where actually a particular country does represent more than one country. I mean, maybe I'm going too fast, but I think I think it does happen in some cases already. Yeah. No. We, we share premises um, yeah. and have done for some time. I've been in and out of Reykjavik on two or three occasions. Um, the British and German embassies are on either side of a shared conference room and a shared security run garage. Um, that's quite useful in terms of uh, how they operate. I, when Kazakhstan and some of the other stars became independent, um, the Germans inherited a large number of East German properties and the British moved in to share some of those. I'm not entirely sure what's happening now. I think there's at least one post in East Africa where we share with the Commission, the, the, what's now the EAS. So uh, uh, one can share to a limited extent actually having a single ambassador is going too far. We have different commercial interests. Um, we're not entirely sure about the consular interests, and we do, uh, as you know, often represent consular interests for each other. Uh, but given that uh, there remain in a lot of countries particular national sensitivities, um, it's not e entirely easy. I've just been to Yerevan. Um, if you were to say to the French that they should have accept a common European um, embassy in Yerevan, when one of the largest Armenian diaspora communities is in France, <coughs> that raises enormous problems. So, you know, as you go around, each country looks different. Nothing colonial about this. If you want to have uh, a post in Tajikistan or Uzbekistan, it, there are good arguments for sharing at least facilities um, and for working, as they already do, very closely with the shared EAS representative. Um, but I'm not sure one needs to go much uh, further than that yet. Is there nowhere that you could do it though, with success? Well, it depends how you do it. I, I, try to, I think it's in Berlin. 
that the Nordic countries have um, embassies in a sort of campus of their own. And it's extremely impressive as it, as it looks. Um, they are separate embassies, but they also share conference rooms uh, on that. Um, it, that sort of halfway house is manageable. You don't um, foresee it ever being the case where you can have a single EU representative? Well, deal with it. the question is, again, um, say a British Airways airliner crashes in Kyrgyzstan, um, and you know, that raises some difficult national issues. Uh, if you have just one common um, European uh, Union ambassador, it may not be that easy to deal with it yet. And that, I, I, I made a British case, but that would be true for a large number of other EU countries. What about nationals who are killed inside various countries or imprisoned um, and, and, and charged with terrorist offences? So the, the main, for all of us, difficult national questions, and that is also a matter of democratic legitimacy. You know, the country's prime minister or foreign minister has to stand up uh, in front of her national parliament and say, I am doing my best for X, Y, and Z, who have been unjustly imprisoned. Um, and if they then say, and of course, we're not doing anything about this, it's all been done by the Europeans for us. I think there are probably 27 member states <laughs> in which there'd be some real problems with the national parliament. Uh, can I just say, I think that this is a more sort of seductive and attractive um, proposal for smaller member states, actually. And I think already, some, and I, I, I don't know exactly where, but I think that there are smaller countries where smaller member states do rely uh, more on the EAS than, than we would as a, as a bigger member state. But let's be in no uh, doubt about it, there are um, countries around the world where we have, uh, the, the UK and the diplomatic service has one representative, you know, so we are small in some areas of the world. Uh, I think we need to be pragmatic in terms of sharing uh, premises. Um, I don't see a scenario where we have European embassies and we don't have a British ambassador. Um, but there may be smaller member states who are more comfortable uh, with that. And I think it's actually I think it's very anti-colonial. I think it's Europe saying, well.